Good morning, I'm Alexis Del Cid in for Jessica Lovell. Welcome to the morning medical update and happy early 4th of July. Every summer around the 4th of July, unfortunately, local fire departments and other groups have to do stuff like this. They blow up watermelons, they burn hot dogs with sparklers, they set up mannequins for elaborate firework safety demonstrations. These displays have become routine, they're so necessary. And the core message is crucial, fireworks truly can be deadly. And according to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, injuries are going up, a 25% increase between 2006 and 2021. Last year, more than 10,000 Americans ended up in an emergency department because of fireworks. Today, we're bringing you all the experts who are all too familiar with the injuries. We're gonna hear what they see this time of year, learn the best safety advice that you can implement starting today, and show you some fun alternatives to the typical fireworks. Joining us today is Dr. Brian Beaver. Dr. Beaver is an emergency medicine physician here at the University of Kansas Health System. And when he's not working here in the ED, he serves as medical director for a couple of local fire mm -hmm. departments, busy guy, Bonner Springs and Edwardsville. And he's also the medical director of Health Star One Air Ambulance. And when a patient gets seriously burned, they head up to the Burn It Burn Unit where Dr. Davil Bavsar works. Dr. Bavsar, thank you for being here. He is a plastic surgeon specializing in burn surgery and co-director of the Burn It Burn Unit. Thank you both for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time. We know you're busy. We should also mention right off the bat that Dr. Bob, sorry, you have a surgery Later right on, after yes. this. After we finish this, yes. For one of your burn patients. Mm, so yes. we're going to we're going to get you to that surgery on time. You know, the safest, smartest option is, of course, not to shoot off your own fireworks, to skip the tent mm -hmm. and go to a professional mm -hmm. fireworks show. But of course, not everybody does that by a long shot. Just you can tell when you're trying to go to sleep at night starting two nights ago. Yeah. You can hear the fireworks out there. So we're going to talk about safety today. But I'm also curious, I'm going to put you on the spot, Dr. Bob Sard, does your family set off their own fireworks? Generally not. The most they do is sparklers. Sparklers. Okay. Dr. Nope, Weaver? We really don't. Not allowed. No, we leave it to the pros. Okay, well, that's that's good. You know, um, it depends on the regulations in our city, but we try yep. to just do sparklers mm -hmm. and those little, those little snap pops like mm -hmm. wherever you're living. You know, if you have yeah. to shoot off fireworks, we do have some straightforward safety tips. Use a hard flat location. Avoid the grass and avoid the trees. Always light from the ground. Never ever hold a lit firework. And have a water supply ready, like a bucket or a garden hose. Only light one firework at a time and never put your face over a mortar. Dr. Beaver, do you have any safety tips you'd like to add based on what you've seen professionally? The only other thing I would add would make sure that any kids of any age, especially teenagers actually, are supervised when they're doing it. Like when you say teenagers, you mean anyone under the age of 19 teenagers? Yes, you know, teenagers just... tend to not always make the best decisions with their right. fireworks. So, And Dr. Bob Sar, what about you? Yeah, any type of fireworks, if it doesn't go off, and you try to like light the fuse, it doesn't work, let it go. Mm -hmm. Don't try to go back, try to kind of light it again. Don't be kind of checking it, uh, leaning over it, because that's when a lot of mortar-related injuries do happen. Mm -hmm. And what do you do if you're setting them all up in the same spot and one doesn't go off? You move to a different spot and just let that one be? Because people are always going mm -hmm. back to that area. Yes, yes. To Wait forever before you go back to the same spot. Mm -hmm. and so if you have multiple fireworks that you're ready to kind of work with, go to the next spot a little bit farther away so that you're safe. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about sparklers. The only time I've ever been injured by a firework was from a sparkler mm -hmm. when I was little because I grabbed it. Mm -hmm. And I noticed when I was going through the injury tally over the weekend, one of our injuries was someone who was apparently injured badly enough to come to the ER with a sparkler mm -hmm. injury. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Beaver, what's your opinion on that? I'm not a big fan of sparklers for, especially for little kids. You typically see it in the hands of the small yeah. children, right. waving them around that don't, uh, as it burns down closer, don't have that concept that they shouldn't reach up and grab it. Do you think it's yeah. a misnomer that people think they're the friendliest? Uh, yes, it's misnomer because like uh, Dr. Beaver said, and then right. we know over years, means a lot of our injuries do come in from sparklers. Sparklers can burn at a very high temperature, close to 2,000 degrees, and it means it can burn almost anything. And when kids are burning multiple sparklers at the same time, 
that creates much more of a hazard because it's going to have much more of a kind of spray of those sparkles, mm -hmm. which can lead to kind of some of them ending up on the hand, creating that uh, heat, and kids just drop them on the feet. Mm -hmm. We have seen that. Mm -hmm. I worry about eye injuries when I see little kids. They Maybe. double fist, the sparklers, mm -hmm. yeah. and then they're running mm -hmm. through your neighborhood right. and they look cute, but I'm so yeah. afraid mm -hmm. one yes. of them's going to get going to get hurt. Absolutely. We have some data mm -hmm. uh, from last 4th of July weekend. Before, between July 1st and 5th, this is last year, the health system treated 29 patients for fireworks injuries, 24 men, 5 women. 11 people ended up needing to be hospitalized, and those ages range from 5 to 45. Right. You never want to hear about a, a five-year-old who has to be hospitalized because of an injury. Based on those stats, Dr. Bob Sar, do you see any patterns here with the kinds of people that you're treating? Generally men, uh, either teenager or young um, male, um, or up to even middle age. Uh, that's the most common. I think the younger kids getting kind of injured is from um, smaller, uh, simpler fireworks, which mm -hmm. parents feel they are safe. Sparklers would be the most common. Mm -hmm. Roman candle would be the another one. But anyone else, so also think of young kids getting in the way of uh, an, an older kid or adult lighting mortar. They are just running around and they are the bystander getting injured. We have had those patients too. And adults as a bystander injury is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. So what kind of injury, Dr. Beaver, would differentiate between, okay, they're treated in the ED versus, oh my gosh, they're going to be hospitalized, they're going to the burnout burn unit? And mm -hmm. Yeah, the simple, uh, the simple burns not involving the face, um, depending on how extensive uh, with the hands, um, genitalia, simple burns we can take care of in the emergency department um, without having to involve the burn team. Once it starts to become uh, particularly the face, uh, extensive burns on the hands, we need to get them involved and get their help, uh, even if nothing else, to make certain that the patients get the appropriate follow-up that they're going to need so that these can heal. Dr. Bob, sorry, is it true second degree burns are the most painful? Yes. Because, Why is that? Yeah, because the nerve endings are all intact and they are the ones on fire. Mm -hmm. And is that the most common kind of injury that you treat, second degree? Generally, generally. But I think in the burn, like so in, in the fireworks related injury, we see quite a bit of blast injury of the hand also. And uh, that, those are much deeper. And anytime there is a flash burn, which most of the fireworks related injury, we have to worry about those burns being deeper can be third degree burns. How do you manage the pain for someone? Most of the times, I think these patients end up requiring IV pain medications, intravenous. Wow. Um, and most of the times, these would be opiates. And even at home, we do send them with some short duration uh, use of oral opiates also. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. So on the burn unit, you see patients that are sent here from other hospitals as well. So Correct. what do you have that the other hospitals don't have? So. Uh, at, at KU uh, Hospital, Vince Burnett Burn Center is uh, kind of uh, the tertiary care burn uh, unit. We are nationally verified by American Burn Association and uh, American College of Surgeons, kind of only facility in the area to have that distinguished uh, kind of uh, verification status. And that allows us to kind of, uh, kind of that means we have on-call burn surgeons available 24-7. We have entire burn team that includes specialized nursing staff, burn technicians, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, and even the OR staff to help take care of these patients. And that always turns out to be better care for these patients. Also, we have a dedicated outpatient treatment unit that allows for these patients to be cared for for follow-up and, and make sure that they are kind of watch for for a longer period of time when they don't need inpatient care, they don't need surgeries, making sure like, that allows them to be absolutely taken care of by a specialized team throughout their uh, kind of, uh, care period. I know you can't say specifics when you answer this, but are any of the patients you're seeing today for surgery patients who were injured because of fireworks over the weekend? Um, I do not know at this moment. Uh -huh. There is probably one. Wow. Okay, so that's yes. always, and you have, I got to ask you about lab-grown skin. That sounds so strange to someone without a medical degree, but you have this technology where you can grow the patient's own skin and use it to, to help yes. them after a burn. Correct. How does that work? So uh, these, uh, uh, so cultured epidermal uh, autographs, CEA, is something that's been around for now nearly 20 years. It's been used uh, 
usually for burns when it is much larger surface area. I means patients who have burns more than 50, 60 percent, 70 percent, where they do not have adequate skin available for skin grafting, I means covering those burn areas. A piece of healthy skin is uh, obtained. It's sent to a lab to grow the outer layer of skin called epidermis and it's grown in uh, large sheets. So we have been able to use it for up to 2,000, 3,000 square centimeters, wow. which is essentially covering both lower extremities, both lower extremities and, and the anterior trunk. Um, it takes a while. It takes between three to six weeks to start getting those uh, grown skin back, but it definitely allows for saving lives. And it is definitely a very effective technology. Dr. Beaver, would you say that this is your unfortunately busy season? We are always busy over the next few days, for sure. Is this the busiest you think you get typically in, over the year? During the summer, um, when you add on the usual traumas that we have this time of year, this definitely is probably our busiest time over the next few days. So when everybody's relaxing on yeah. their day off, we gotta think of you and your staff yeah. because <laughs> you are working so hard for yeah. people who are injured. I also wanna um, be sure to invite you to ask your questions. When you're watching this, you can use the chat to contact us in so many ways. YouTube, Facebook, you can tweet us, you can email the Medical News Network. All the information with those connections is right there on your screen. And we can't forget, COVID doesn't get a vacation. Yeah. Want to check in with Dr. Dana <laughs> Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Hopefully the numbers are nice yeah. and low though. Yeah, COVID doesn't get a vacation, <laughs> that's for sure. However, again, the impact on most people's daily lives with that is extremely minimal. That is a good thing, but we know that there still are people that are affected. Um, right now we have very low counts in the hospital. We have only nine total. Five of those are active and two in the ICU, none on the ventilator. So good uh, low community circulation and low impact to the hospital systems as well. I wanna keep you around to talk about your thoughts on malaria because normally yeah. in the US, mm -hmm. we hear about malaria patients that might've gone somewhere else, yeah. traveled out of the country, got malaria, come back home. But the CDC is now trying to figure out how five different people caught malaria mm -hmm. who didn't travel. Four of those patients are in Florida. Another is in Texas. Mm -hmm. They're all improving. Yeah. What do you make of this? Yeah, again, they were treated. I think it is interesting. There are two groups. Uh, one was in Texas, one in Florida. You know, we have uh, historically had malaria in the United States. Um, you know, way back when there's even been malaria in Missouri. Again, these are, are quite some time ago uh, with the advent of a public health infrastructure, things of that nature, the ability to keep our communities um, free of, of excess water where the uh, mosquitoes like to be. We haven't had the endemic uh, malaria that some of the other countries do, especially some countries that neighbor us. Right now what the CDC found was that there were two groups, like you said, uh, one in Texas and one in Florida that had locally acquired uh, malaria. So that is a concern. Um, we know that the last time that happened was in 2003. I believe there were like eight cases uh, in Palm Beach, Florida as well. So we have had uh, sporadic locally uh, acquired infections of malaria, but again, nothing for the last 20 years. Uh, I think it is important to understand that there are investigations going on. There are local um, uh, interventions that are being done to help reduce the mosquito population as well. This certainly could be an impact of climate change also. Uh, I think it is important to note and understand that we need to continue to use and promote prevention. You know, if you are going to be outdoors, especially during this time when a lot of people are outdoors celebrating, it is vitally important to wear bug spray as well. That will help reduce your chance of getting bit uh, by mosquitoes. We know that other than malaria, we do have have other uh, bacteria and viruses that can be spread by ticks, by mosquitoes. So I think it is important to understand that as well. And we do have those mosquitoes uh, that uh, transmit um, malaria, we do have those mosquitoes in our region as well. Right now, we haven't seen any uh, any locally acquired malaria, and certainly in, in my practice and in my ID colleagues, we do uh, get concerned when people are coming back from travel from end endemic countries, but we'll also be uh, investigating and keeping our, our ears up for uh, cases uh, that may be local as well. How complicated or simple is it to treat if a malaria patient walked into our ED right now? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's fairly easy to treat. Again, uh, other countries are, are much more impacted by malaria than we are in the United States. We know that we do have the drugs. We know that we have the drugs to treat malaria here at the health system. Um, but it's also, I think it's more difficult to diagnose than other infections just because we are not used to seeing it. So it, it takes um, coordination with our micro lab and our, our technicians there to look at the smears of people's blood, so blood samples to look for those parasites in general. There is also some uh, lab tests that we can use as well. But I think it's really being aware of that possible diagnosis and testing for it. If we are able to find a positive, we do have the drugs to treat it. And I can see Dr. Beaver, you're nodding your head yes, mm -hmm. yes. vehemently. Absolutely. I mean, while thankfully it's not something we have to deal with uh, on a regular basis, just like we did with COVID, we're always keeping our eyes and ears out for what's the next emerging thing that we need to be ready for to walk through the doors. And uh, speaking of, I want to go back to our fireworks discussion mm -hmm. because that's going to be the most common thing, walking through the emergency yes. department <laughs> doors. Dr. Hawkinson, do you yeah. light off fireworks? No, I haven't for, for many, many years. I just I, I would prefer just teenage, to sit and watch. Teenager, yeah. The yeah. age that the doctor saying needs to be supervised. Yeah, we used to do not, yeah. not the most fun things. And certainly, as Dr. Bob Sar said, you know, it is that um, that adolescent to young mm -hmm. men age that really uh, probably put themselves in the riskiest positions. <laughs> the to, most fun is typically injured. the most yeah. dangerous yeah. when it comes to the, the fireworks. Yeah. Stay safe. We need we need you, Dr. Hogginson. Well, be we'll be around. We need all of us. Yeah, right? we need, I mean, we need all of us. And, and I would say that that our emergency medicine colleagues are uh, probably the most astute because they are on the front line, the tip of that spear for identifying people who may uh, have. Uh, malaria, you know, doing those initial evaluations mm -hmm. and then having that concern and then consulting us. So, I want to ask if we have any reporters on the line today who have any questions. Good news, we have plenty of questions from our community. So let's get right to Jerry. Jerry wants to know, I've heard of fish skin being used as a skin graft. Does that work and do we do that here? So, fish skin. Yes. Okay. So uh, there, there is one uh, commercially available product in the United States. It is from North Atlantic Cod, um, and that skin is available. It is available at uh, KU also. That is used for partial thickness, means superficial or superficial partial burn, second degree burn. Uh, it helps improve healing for those burns. Generally, those burns can heal, but this kind of graft can help those uh, wounds heal well and a bit faster. Uh, it is used in selective situations, but definitely it's available. It is. Um, a, a useful tool in helping wounds heal. Yeah. Yen has an interesting question. Yen wants to know when you're treating a patient with burns, or even if this happens at home, should you remove their clothes when you're cooling with water? What should be done if the clothes are already stuck to the skin? Oh, that's right. a great question. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, when the clothes are stick, uh, stuck to the skin, do not try to rip that, but just try to cool it. At some point, either the skin, that outer layer, when it starts falling off, those uh, stuck kind of fragments of clothing will fall off with it, or at least you will reduce the amount of injury you cause by unnecessarily ripping it too much. Cooling is the most important thing at that time. So using um, kind of cool tap water or cooled water, not ice water, or definitely not ice, for cooling is important mm -hmm. and do it for 15 to 20 minutes. Dr. Mm -hmm. Beaver, why not ice? I thought when you're burned, the first thing you do is put ice. Yeah, ideally we want cool water. We don't want to actually put that in freezing water. We don't want to create more tissue damage okay. um, by putting it in contact actually with ice. So as Dr. Bobstar said, just cool tap water is perfect. Joellen has a question about the malaria. So Dr. Hawkinson, I'm gonna bring you in here. Joellen yeah. wants to know, could there be more cases of malaria walking around, mm -hmm. just not being treated? Or even could there be asymptomatic malaria? Yeah, cases? generally, that's a very good question. Generally with malaria, you are going to have symptoms. You may initially feel like it, it might be a cold or, or some other just re regular systemic viral illness with things like fevers, chills, and that's what actually happened to one of these uh, young patients that was diagnosed. He had that for several weeks because he was originally misdiagnosed as just a viral infection, but he was having uh, chills and shakes in the morning, fevers, uh, muscle aches, things of that nature for a couple weeks, three to four weeks, I believe. He did have a misdiagnosis of a, a just a viral infection. That's a kind of a, hmm. a 
catchment for, for just what we necessarily don't necessarily know, but believe there's probably some infection. Now, are you going to be asymptomatic? Probably not. I, I don't believe you're going to have people just who are just walking around with it. Um, and so that is a very good question. You will be symptomatic. You'll probably go to a, uh, an evaluation by uh, either an urgent care, your primary doctor, or emergency department as well. Carrie would like the doctors to clarify or kind of go through, can you please differentiate between first, second, and third degree burns, Dr. Bobsar? Okay, so first degree burn is like a sunburn where skin remains intact, it just gets red discoloration uh, and it takes about seven to 10 days to heal. Most of the times, so there's no blistering and it ta uh, you only thing you have to do is keep it cool and then cover it with some uh, emollient or moisturizer for pain and comfort. Second degree burns are where you end up seeing some blisters, but the most of the skin is still intact underneath. And those burns with good wound care can heal between two to three weeks. And those are the ones that are very painful. Now, first degree burn can be painful, but not as much. Second degree burn is what is gonna be most painful. Now, some of the deeper second degree burns require definitely more um, close uh, kind of observation, care, and even sometimes surgery, because there, the deeper burns, deeper second degree burns cannot heal in timely fashion. It can cause scarring. It requires definitely a very specialized and more close care kind of on observation. Finally, the third degree burn is where the entire thickness of the skin is burned. It will be more like a charred skin. And, and, and I'm sorry, I'm using like a grilling kind of analogy, but if you think of grill, you're having those char look of the skin is what the third degree burn would be. Oh, wow. And that is when you definitely require um, surgical intervention, getting that uh, burn skin removed surgically and then help it heal unless it is a very small narrow line of uh, kind of burn mm -hmm. that can still heal with time. Dr. Beaver, Linda mm -hmm. wants to know what's the worst fireworks related injury you've ever seen? The worst fireworks related injury I've ever seen um, has been when, as Dr. Bob Sarr mentioned, a mortar did not go off and it was a very large mortar and uh, the patient walked over and looked down into it and then it exploded right into their face and torso. Um, that was definitely the worst one that I did have seen. Did they survive? They did survive, but unfortunately were uh, no longer able to see and yeah. So they survived, but they lost their lost sight. Their sight. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. holy smokes, yeah. Dr. Bobsar, what about you? Um, seen many doing uh -huh. what I do. Uh, the worst one that, in, in terms of both emotionally and functionally, that it was like so emotionally for me and functionally for the the person who got injured was a young child, same mortar M80, um, grabbed after July 4th. Yeah. Parents had already put it in the can I say. Um, the boxes away, but kids, the boys were just curious, wanted to do it again, and then got hold of those MAD, tried to kind of light it, and it blew off a five-year-old child's hand. And oh, it was yeah. a real complete blown hand where mm -hmm. all fingers were lost, mm -hmm. and it essentially was like losing the entire hand. Mm -hmm. And that was both, like I said, emotionally also very challenging for us. The family, as well as a family oh, the and the child. the must have been uh, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. just riddled with so, guilt. And, and, and that is what I kind of yeah. try to kind of talk about, said as much as fireworks seem innocuous, it's yeah. fun, it is part of our culture. It is very, very disastrous when they, things go wrong. And those numbers don't lie. Those 10,000 or so injuries are real. One thing, if I have time, to, I want to talk yeah, about is, yeah. so the burn, like fireworks related burn injuries were decreasing between 2000 to 2018, 19. And after COVID 2020, they have increased, in fact, kind of skyrocketed because the personal usage of fireworks was a little bit less over time. And with 2020 and COVID related restrictions, most cities did not do large fireworks shows and parents took it up on themselves to do the fireworks at home and that tradition has continued. So 2020 has been a big spike and it has continued because now again, the recent history and recent kind of memory serves well because it is fun to light fireworks at home with parents, with family, with friends but that has increased the number of cases and we have seen that, that we had a huge spike in 2020. You just answered Pauline's question, which was 
do you have any idea why fireworks injuries are going up? And mm -hmm. that answers it perfectly, and mm -hmm. you're nodding your head yes, Dr. Mm -hmm. Beaver. Yeah. Um, seems like the pandemic caused a lot of unintended troubles mm -hmm. that, yes. that we didn't foresee yes. when this all happened. I want to bring the whole panel in for today's takeaways. Dr. Beaver, what would you like people to know who are watching? I think if you are going to shoot off fireworks, number one, please follow your local laws and ordinances. And my firefighters, I would be disappointing them if I didn't mention that aside from all the injuries we've talked about every year, there's property damage all across the country, homes completely burned down, lives turned upside down from fireworks that land on roofs. Um, etc. So please, if you are going to shoot them off, exercise the utmost caution when you do so. If you could snap your fingers, Dr. Bob, sorry, and make all fireworks, at-home fireworks illegal, would you? Knowing what you know, seeing what you see? I don't want to be that person, but right. most jurisdictions in, in our kind of metro area do have restrictions. That doesn't stop people from doing it. So I would rather say, if you're going to do it, please be safe. Know that that can be a disaster injury to your loved one or you yourself. And that can be absolutely life-changing. Regrets don't help that kind of injury. Losing a hand, losing a finger, having a burn of the face, being kind of having a significant scarring of any body part for that matter will not be kind of something that you will kind of see as a value that how much enjoy, like enjoyment you get out of fireworks. So live it up to the professionals if you can. Yeah, and so don't go back to the mortar. Correct, Don't lean Correct. over it and yes. don't yes. light something when it's in your hand. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hawkinson, what are your final takeaways? Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna be prevention. You know, it's just understanding what situation are you in. Uh, prevention, you know, as we've heard from our, our expert panelists here about uh, if you are doing fireworks, how to, how to best prepare and things to do to be safe while you're doing it. And then prevention as far as from in the infectious disease uh, aspect, you know, wear your bug spray, the bug spray with DEET in it, the insect repellent. Uh, we don't really have malaria around here. It's a, it would be extremely low risk, but we do have other infections that you can get from mosquitoes, from ticks. And we know that a lot of people like to go to, to local lakes or local parks where there is brush and grass and where there ticks are uh, there, mosquitoes are there as well, so get that bug spray on as well as your sunscreen as well. What are you going to be doing tomorrow, Dr. Hawkinson? Uh, probably relaxing, I don't know, nice. probably working, I never probably heard you working say, a little you, bit, so. Oh, yeah. You always say you're working, I've never heard you say you're relaxing and then just stop at that. Well, i got to work first. Yes, yeah. yes, you do, <laughs> you've got important things to do. Doctors, do you have any fun plans, are you both going to be working here? I am off for the first All time right. in several Fourth of July, so nice. I'm going to enjoy being home with the family. Right. Hope yeah. your phone doesn't go off. Yes, yes. Yeah. Dr. Bob Sar? As a burn surgeon, it's the season. Yeah, so you're I'll be in here. There. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for doing what you do. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And thank, thank you. you so much to our viewers today for watching. We hope you're safe. And we still want the holiday to be special and fun for little kids. So before we go, here's a quick look at a few firework alternatives that will not send you to the ED. <laughs> Coming up Wednesday on Open Mics with Dr. Stites. When Kyle Mead was getting chemo infusions, it gave him diabetes. Luckily, his doctors had a new option, chemotherapy in a pill. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Open Mics with Dr. Stites. The risks and rewards of keeping heavy duty cancer drugs in the medicine cabinet, Wednesday at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.